Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. On this auspicious day of Ganesha Chaturthi, who is also called as Vigna Vinashaka, I pray that he removes all the obstacles in your journey leading to Labasna. Wish you all a happy and a prosperous Ganesha Chaturthi from Team Baiju's. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article of discussion is about appointment of the governors. What is the context? The center on Sunday appointed new governors for about five states. In this backdrop. Let us try and understand what is the process for the appointment of governor to the states. Article 153 of the Indian Constitution speaks about the governors of the state. It says that there shall be a governor for each state. In case the central government is not able to appoint the governor for a state, then the same governor can be appointed for one or more states. So it is Article 153 of the Indian Constitution which speaks about the governor of the state. So the executive power of the state is vested in the governor and all executive action of the state has to be taken in the name of the governor. Then it also speaks about the appointment of the governor. This is mentioned under Article 155 of the Indian Constitution. According to this particular article, the governor of the state shall be appointed by the president of India. So what it means is that he is a nominee of the central government. So it is not the direct view of the president, but indirectly supported by the cabinet. Then it also speaks about the qualifications. This is mentioned under Article 157 of the Indian Constitution. What are the qualifications as mentioned under the Constitution? One, he has to be a citizen of India. This is the major and the important one. The person who is not a citizen of India cannot be appointed appointed as the governor of a particular state. This is also followed by an age criteria. What is it? It requires every governor that is appointed to a particular state to have fulfilled an age of 35 years. So first, he has to be a citizen of India and he should have completed 35 years of age. This is according to the constitution of India. But there are some conventions as well. What are these conventions? These are nothing but principles that have been followed from a very long time. This is not mentioned in the law. This is not mentioned in the constitution. But because there has been a past precedent and because it is carried forward from that period till now which is called as the convention. According to the conventions which is not mentioned in the constitution he should be an outsider not from the same state to which he is being appointed. Let's say for example there is a person who is appointed to the state of Maharashtra as the governor of Maharashtra. So what the first convention says is that this person should not be a domicile or a person living in the state of Maharashtra. The next convention it speaks about is the president is also also required to consult the chief minister. Is this working in reality? Is it the hard and fast rule? Is it actually practiced when it comes to the real time scenario? This is the question. It is being followed but at the same time there have been examples as well where this is not followed. Let's take the first example. Is the outsider always appointed as the governor? No. Let's take an example of Nehru who wanted to appoint a non-Bengali governor during the chief ministership of B.C. Roy. But this idea of appointing a non-Bengali governor was opposed by B.C. Roy. That is when Nehru had to succumb to the pressure of B.C. Roy and he had to appoint H.C. Mukherjee as the governor. So is it a rigid rule? Not actually because there have been changes in the past. Then there is the president who is also required to consult the chief minister. Is it being followed? Not actually. This is with respect to the appointment of Sri Prakasha in the state of Madras back then. Then Nityananda Kanungo was also appointed as the governor of Bihar. In fact, Chief Minister Mahamaya Prasad Simha protested this particular move but the center rejected his move and also his protest against the appointment of Nityananda Kanungo. So looking at all this, what the central government is also doing is it is also appointing all those important personalities who have been retired from their political services and there are also bureaucrats who are also appointed as the governors. Let's take the example in the present scenario. Bandaru Dattatreya was a union minister but currently he is retired from politics. That is why he is being appointed as a governor. There have been past examples as well. Former union minister Najma Heptullah was appointed 
as the governor of Manipur. Former Rajya Sabha MP VP Singh Badnore was appointed as the Punjab's governor. And when it comes to the bureaucrats, even they have been appointed as the governors of a particular state. Ashwani Kumar, who happens to be a retired IPS officer, was appointed as the governor. MK Narayanan, a retired bureaucrat, was also appointed as the governor. This governor's position, which should have taken an eminent personality into picture for his appointment, is not being done. But instead, retired politicians, retired bureaucrats are being appointed. In order to avoid this, there were certain recommendations in the past from the Sarkaria committee as well as the Punchi committee. Let us try to understand what are these recommendations. The Sarkaria committee in the year 1983 came up with certain recommendations. What are these? One, he said that this person who is appointed as a governor of a particular state should be a detached figure. He should not be part of the intense political links. He should not have taken part in the politics in the recent past. And besides, he should not be a part of the ruling party. Is this being followed? Unfortunately not. Because the political persons who have been affiliated to the party are being appointed as the governors of a particular state. The governor should also be an eminent personality in some walk of life and should be from outside the state. This is the second recommendation. The third recommendation says that he should be appointed after effective consultations with the state chief minister, the vice president of India and the speaker of Lok Sabha. And as far as possible, the governor should also enjoy a five-year duration for his stay in that particular state were some of the recommendations given by the Sarkaria Commission in the year 1983. The Punchi Commission, which gave its report in the year 2007, also came up with a similar mandate. The Punchi Commission recommended that all those people appointed to a particular state as a governor should not have participated in the recent politics, even at the local level, at least for a few years before their entry as the governor of a state. The state chief minister should should have a say in the appointment of the governor and their appointment of the governor should be entrusted to a committee comprising the Prime Minister, Home Minister, Speaker of the Lok Sabha and Chief Minister of the concerned state. The Vice President can also be involved during this process is the recommendation given by the Punchi Commission. So what we have to understand in this scenario is certain recommendations given by the Sarkaria Commission, given by the Punchi Commission is not into implementation is what this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article here is speaking about NRC which is on the page one. Then there is also an editorial that is discussed with respect to the NRC. A small clarification before we continue with this particular NRC topic. Yesterday while we had discussed, we spoke with reference to those people who are part of India but from different states whose names are not mentioned in the NRC list. We also took the example of X who happens to be a citizen of India but from a different state. Then we spoke about Y who is the wife of X and then we also spoke about Z who happens to be their kid. We also discussed that both Y and Z are part of the NRC list but Z is not part of the NRC list because he is from a different state. So what you have to understand is with respect to the context here. The context is, let's say for example, there are people from different states. Let's say the state of Maharashtra, Arunachal Pradesh, West Bengal, so on and so forth. These people can also be enlisted in NRC. However, there is requirement for some legal documents. In case there are these legal documents not produced by these people, then their names is not given in the NRC list. At times, they may also give relevant documents as well. But these documents are not in line by the prescribed standards of the Assam. Even in such case, there have been instances where these people's papers have been rejected. So the point is, yes, they are citizens of India, but the problem is they will not be part of NRC. Hence, because they are not part of NRC, their proposal as Indian citizens could be rejected. So this was what the statement was made. This is in reference to the legal documents that has to be in prescribed form format as per the Assam laws. So kindly understand this. They can be part of NRC but the problem is they'll have to produce all these legal documents in a prescribed format as given by the Assam law. In case there is any deviation there have been certain discretions that is given to the government officials and they are able to reject all these documents in the past. As a 
reference let's also take an example as mentioned under today's article there was a family four persons from the family had got into the nrc list there were four daughters from the same family have also got into the nrc list but the father has not got into the nrc list simple reason being all these people have given the same documents but the father also giving the same documents his name is not there on the nrc list this is because of the administrative issues this is also because of some discretion that has been given to the state officials so what it means is they are genuine citizens of india but sometimes because of some discretion their names are not enlisted in this nrc likewise people from different parts of india's name can also be not present in that nrc list not that they are not citizens of india but this is not following a prescribed standard as laid by the assam laws now let's look at what is spoken under this article the nrc list has yielded an updated register and it has also come up with a number ideally what this nrc meant was that it will remove all the lacuna areas the disturbances and come up with a clear picture as who is part of assam from a very long period of time to weed out the illegal immigrants of what has it done right now it has led to lot of ambiguity and gray area people are not sure what would happen in the future what about those 19 lakh people where will they be housed what is their scenario what would happen to them in the future the central government has not given a clear picture about so ideally this has supposed to be a judiciary led process which was supposed to be a robust and one which will give an ultimate conclusion but what has this led to an errors due to some administrative issues and procedural factors as well as a result the state government has given certain leisure time as well in order to ensure that there is recourse and alternative right now but there are also other political parties then there are ngos who have also stepped in all these ngos the political parties right now have stepped in and have said that they are ready to stand by them provide them all the legal help as well as proof unfortunately what the article says is all these local political parties should have lent their support initially when the nrc started why because these people who are fighting for this particular cause to have their names into the nrc list majority of them are illiterate they do not know how to document a particular situation they do not know what are the legal proof that is required it is then that their necessity was required and not now so going forward it is requesting all the political parties the ngos working for them to stand with the poor why because the poor will have to identify what is the basic documentation that is required the poor will also have to somehow arrange for the money because they will have to fight the court cases they'll have to go to the foreign tribunal they'll have to go to the high court as well as the supreme court as well so arranging money for all these poor people to fight for their cause is another important thing the editorial is suggesting and the third important factor is with respect to the judiciary itself the judiciary is already clogged with crores of cases when these cases hit the high court and when it hits the supreme court the already clogged up judiciary will it be able to deliver the justice is what the editorial is trying to question ultimately this will lead to a common cause saying that justice delayed is justice denied is what this article all about now let's look into the next article this article says mamla puram to host modi ji meet in october The first meeting between India and China informally happened in Wuhan in China. The second meeting between India and China informally will take place in Mamlapuram in the state of Tamil Nadu. What are we discussing right now? We will focus on the Mamlapuram which can be a place in news in the UPSC. However, with respect to the informal summit, we will take it up as and when this happens. Now let's focus on the Mamlapuram factor. This is also known as Seven Pagodas or Mahabalipuram and it is in the state of Tamil Nadu. It is called as Seven Pagodas because initially during the time of marco polo there were about seven temples and all these temples were present in that place that is why it is called as seven pagodas however in the present scenario there is only one temple that is left out and that is in the form of shore temple it is only temple that is present right now back then there were seven temples that is why it is also called as seven pagodas this place of mamlapuram is on the coromandel coast of the bay of bengal about 60 kilometers south of the chennai city this place mamlapuram was one of the major port cities by 7th century 
within the Pallava kingdom. This is also known as the region for temples as well as the cave sanctuaries. The descent of Ganges, also known as Arjuna's penance at Mamlapuram, is one of the largest rock relief in Asia and also features a number of Hindu stories as well. The Shore Temple, which is also present, which is part of the seven pagodas, is so named because it overlooks the shore of the Bay of Bengal. It was built in the 7th century under the reign of Narsimha Varman II. It is a structural temple built with the blocks of granite. It has been classified as the UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1984. So kindly remember all these key factors because this can be a prospective question in your preliminary examination. But we will have an elaborate discussion of the informal summit once we have the meeting. As of now, this is all we have to understand. Let's look into the next article. This article here is speaking about India and Pakistan relationship with respect to Kashmir. Pakistan as a country was born on the failed idea that people from different religions cannot coexist or live peacefully. It was this very thought that led to the creation of the state of Pakistan practicing a theological principle which is run by the army with the mask of a civilian government. Pakistan for all its existence need two things to keep away from real issues of poverty, education, health away. What are those? One, it feels that India is a major threat for the existence of Pakistan. It is this lie that has been perpetuated time after time in Pakistan. Then there is Kashmir issue which Pakistan feels it has stakes in it but unfortunately it is not the reality because Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India and will always be an integral part of India for time eternity. In this particular backdrop with respect to Kashmir, Pakistan has come up with some disturbing statements. Its head of the state prime minister has been threatening India with violence against India, threatening even a nuclear catastrophe. The diplomats are calling for jihad. Their ministers are also calling for a possibility of a nuclear warfare. This is ultimately nothing but irresponsible, careless, immature but this can have serious and dangerous implications. Why? Because some of the senior diplomats have also called for jihad against India. It is this idea of jihad through which they have been infiltrating terrorists into India, supporting the Islamist terrorist outfits and all that this will do is harm the relationship relationship going forward between India and Pakistan. While all this is happening, the political rhetoric, war of words, pouncing on India with words and war threats have been emanating from the Pakistani politicians. The military has taken a step further, has tested a surface-to-surface -surface missile amid all these tensions. So the major problem with Pakistan right now is it is trying to compare India with its own muzzle power. It is trying to compare the military of Pakistan with the military of India and all that it is doing is taking the resources of its economy that has to be put towards health, education and other sectors into the fold of military. It is only few people with the feudal mindset who have been wreaking benefits out of it. But unfortunately, Pakistan is the major sufferer. So what the author says is, Pakistan as a theological society with the feudal mindset of few people have failed the state of Pakistan, all because of its policies that are diverted towards military. And at the same time, the editorial also brings about a word of caution. What is it? Pakistan is a theological society, but we are based on principles of democracy and the principles of secularism. There is a fundamental difference between both these countries. While one country goes about with escalating words, coming up with war of words, India will have to be cautious because India is a responsible country. Just because they are igniting passion from Pakistan, India should be very cautious in choice of words because India is a responsible country because going forward, it is India which will act as a major power across the world. There is some ambiguity right now and ambiguity is the essence of diplomacy. But unfortunately, this is not the right time for India to bring about and initiate more ambiguity. Why? Because we have brought a change with respect to the Kashmir. We have disrupted the equilibrium in Jammu and Kashmir. So what it means means is that India will also have to restore some amount of tranquility between India and Pakistan. So what it requests the government functionaries is to resist the temptation to match the Pakistan leadership in irresponsible rhetoric. 
because we are one of the responsible citizens we should not be matching with pakistan in the war of words is what this editorial all about now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about climate change and how the entire world and its community members and countries will have to come together to address these key provisions when it comes to climate change is what this article all about when you look at the political structure right now a change in the political system somewhere in some part of the country will have its implications felt in india there are economic issues which are happening between china as well as usa so any trade war that is happening somewhere between different countries will also have its heat felt in india so we are a globalized world we are integrated politically as well as economically shashi tharoor in one of his speeches as he speaks about the tragic death of princess diana says an english princess with a welsh title lives a french hotel with an egyptian companion who has supplanted a pakistani she gets into a german car with a dutch engine that is driven by a belgian chauffeur full of scottish whiskey they are then chased by the italian paparazzi on a japanese scooters and mobikes into a swiss built tunnel where they crush a rescue is briefly attempted by an american doctor using brazilian medicines and the whole story is narrated in boston where the indian mp shashi tharoor narrates this whole incident with regard to the idea of globalization so we live in an era of globalization where the political system the economic system is completely integrated so what the author calls for is an integration of environment as well but are we connected environmentally with the nature right now the answer to this is no the mother nature has been singing praises about human prosperity in the past but now we have abused the mother nature she is crying and all that we have to is face the music because of this disruption so what this article currently says is she takes the example of the amazon fires there have been few people who have lit fire to this amazon forest this amazon forest was supplying about 20% of the oxygen to the world but unfortunately this forest have been lit up due to the narrow mind of few people and this is ultimately resulting in a global chaos when questioned what this issue is all about brazilian president jair bolsonaro said that it was an internal matter for brazil and the world need not have to interfere with this part of the country then there are issues with respect to the american president donald trump as well he was one of those presidents who withdrew himself from the paris summit what this means is the country which had a major advancement in the industrial revolution sector has abused the nature but it is not ready to take up the responsibility right now for whatever it has committed in the past apart from mr donald trump the british prime minister boris johnson who happens to be a voter critic of the european integration has also lived his idea in ambiguity once he says that he supports the cause of the paris summit he supports the ideas of climate change and bringing in pumping in the money but at the same time he refrains any ideas of integration so the world community right now has been living on nationalism has been living on development and their primary focus is narrow windows of development and what is missing is the global integration when it comes to mother nature meanwhile what we have to also understand is this climate change which is happening in one part is also resulting and creating flutters in other parts of the country let's take some of the examples heat waves which are not seen in europe is being felt by the people of european community and this has ultimately resulted in melting of glaciers in greenland as well and what are we people doing we are not asking the questions of why there is melting of glaciers but instead we are planning to economic economically extract as many minerals as possible the rare earth minerals from this very region of greenland and we are anticipating and wishing that there is more glaciers that are burnt all because of our narrow interests so what the author says is anything anywhere in different part of the country which is affecting the mother nature its implication its impact its heat is felt by people who have no local stand in this particular issue and they will have to face the brunt of climate change in some other part of the country what she also says is that there are number of issues in hand one is with respect to the energy consumption in the form of petrol and diesel where there is increase in the greenhouse gases and this has ultimately resulted in changes within the climate as well and who is responsible for it and it is we who are responsible for it apart from 
the accumulation of the greenhouse gases there have been certain changes when it comes to the land use pattern as well it is these changes with respect to the greenhouse gases the land use pattern the deforestation industrial agricultural system and desertification are the major drivers for the climate change so what this means is that we have abused overused and sometimes misused all the resources that have been provided by the mother nature to the human prosperity and what this means is that we will have to bring about a new change when it comes to the land management there have been decades of poor land management in the agricultural sector why because we have been using chemicals year after year and the fertility of the soil has been lost all those indigenous crops which were once present in that particular area are all replaced by the monoculture so what it means is increase in the chemicals the diversification which was once present has been neutralized with the more monoculture for the sake of profits and what this has led to is the committing of suicides by the farmers so who is responsible for it it is ultimately us the onus is on us so what we need is solutions to the farming community so what we need going forward is the sustainable agricultural practices so what are these agricultural practices that we need to look at going forward one is with respect to the chemical fertilizers reducing the chemical input and also coming closer to the methodologies of the nature is the first step that we need to initiate as we also discussed what we have is the indigenous crops that are grown in a particular region this has been replaced by a monoculture so going forward this conversion from the indigenous crops to the monoculture has to be avoided and what we need is more growth of the indigenous crop variety there is one of the beautiful philosophical thoughts which says there is everything for the man's need but not for the man's greed one of the greed of the man is that there is food that is stored only for a particular community or for a country in a specific part of the world so what this means is that there is also food wastage in some part of the country so going forward establishing sustainable food system also means reducing the food wastage which we are currently following along with these changes that we currently have we also need to put an end to deforestation while conserving all the mangroves the peatland as well as other wetlands so what the author calls for going forward is that these issues of climate change should not be viewed from the narrow lens of nationalism but because they are transnational in nature what we need is a planetary ethics in the form of vasudeva kutumbakam where the world is one single family so what we need going forward is a sense of solidarity across boundaries across countries across regions and not building fortiers within the boundaries and raising the pitch of nationalism so what we have to understand going forward is that all these boundaries does not matter and what we need is a concept of vasudeva kutumbakam where we are coming up together to fight the menace of climate change and respecting the mother nature going forward so this is what this article all about now let's look into some of the prelims practice questions the longest electrified rail tunnel is in the state of andhra pradesh why have we picked this up that is because this article speaks about the longest electrified rail tunnel and that is about 6.6 km and this is in the state of andhra pradesh that is situated from cherlopalli to raparu railway station the height of this particular tunnel is about 6.5 meters so what is the significance of this project at present the number of good trains on an average take about 10 hours to travel from krishna pattam port to obula varipalli but on this newly electrified line the travel time gets reduced by about 5 hours thereby resulting in saving of about 5 hours now let's look into the next practice question the golden triangle in the indian tourism circuit includes delhi kolkata agra mumbai and jaipur the answer to this is 1 3 and 5 this includes delhi agra as well as jaipur why have we picked this up because there is a reference that is made with respect to the golden triangle of delhi agra and jaipur and this golden triangle is believed to have had several shiva temples or shivalayas now let's look into the next practice question regarding ajmer darga which of the following statements are correct it is a sufi shrine of revered sufi saint moinuddin chusti he was born in india he traveled across south asia even eventually settling in ajmer
Sushma. Which of these statements are correct? The answer to this is 1. Why? Because he was not born in India, but he was born in Iran. Why have we picked this up? Because there is a reference that has been made with respect to the Ajmer Darga. Now let's look into the next practice question. The Bermuda Triangle sometime seen in news is in which ocean? The answer to this is Atlantic Ocean. Now let's look into what this Bermuda Triangle is. This basically includes the ocean of the southern east tip of Florida, Bermuda as well as Puerto Rico. Because this is in the form of a triangle, that is why it is called as Bermuda Triangle. Why have we picked this up? Because there is one of the hurricane called as Dorian which would be impacting Florida very shortly. Now let's look into the next practice question. The global infrastructure facility is or an World Bank collaboration that facilitates the preparation and structuring of complex infrastructure public-private partnerships to enable mobilization of private sector as well as institutional investor capital. Now let's look into the mains practice question. The narrow lens of nationalism will not serve us in addressing transnational challenges of climate change explain on how one can transcend conventional boundaries to meet planetary ethos. The next question says, illustrate with example as to how the post of governor has become a parking lot for the retired politicians, bureaucrats and judges. Please write all your answers on the comment section so that you guys can have a peer review and also come up with constructive criticism in case of any. This is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.